So we inside. Yes, we yeah. inside. <laughs> yes, so it is five o'clock, six o'clock. Oh no, it's still two minutes. In, but yeah. Yeah, still, still two minutes. So wait a second. While you do this, if we are in StreamYard, how are you engaging with the comments and thing on Facebook? Or do, you, um, or do you not deal up with the comments on Facebook? No, you can see the comments. You can see the comments. So that means you as the host have to be toggling between windows? Yeah, there's a, yeah, I can, I'm toggling between banners and that kind of thing, brand and that kind of thing. So, mm. so you you have to be a producer then as well? Yeah. Well, gotcha. stream, I kind of make it easier. It's, would it would, you know. would StreamYard allow, does it have a setup that would allow for you to have an external producer so that somebody else is doing that toggling between windows and you could uh, just host? Or, no. or does it have to be that the, the person who is hosting is doing that? Well, I mean, if you have if you have external camera, yeah, you could do it that way. Mm. Somebody could be on the laptop and you just be on the camera. But, but then uh, you would have to have the external camera, of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. Gotcha. So we are live. We are live. Nicola, Nicola is on. We are live. She said hello. I saw some, some hearts. Hello. Yeah. So to begin with, let me, let me talk about the frogs. The frogs that everybody. The frogs. <laughs> yeah. So we have seen the frogs. Now we are hearing the frogs. Yes. The frogs I think, are out of control. I, I think I think that's amazing though, you know, because it is it's seldom here hear frogs, you know. I like mean I, I love them. I love I, and as much as they're out of control, they're taking over my apartment, they're drowning out my phone calls. In spite of all that, I love them because for me, those cookie frogs are the sound of Trinidad. Eh? Mm -hmm. Every, everywhere I have lived in Trinidad. You hear those frogs at night. I've not been to a part of Trini where I didn't hear them. So like the 10 years that I spent in the States, that was one of the things I missed the most was the sound of these frogs at night, you know? So I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that they've taken over my living space. Mm -hmm. I suppose I allow them. But yeah, these these frogs are the sound of home to me. The sound of home. <laughs> Because I was I was making a I was writing a well I wrote a, a short status I saw the for the day, and I mentioned like you know the sound of punk and axe has returned mm -hmm. <laughs> and fireflies like I haven't seen fireflies in a while. I don't hear as much I find, I know? agree with that. I don't see fireflies as much. Uh, I don't hear frogs, you know. But slowly and surely, you know, things are. When last you caught men? I haven't seen one of those in ages. Shred, where I live right now, I moved into this flat about a year ago, and I haven't seen cock and hens in years. And when I moved in here, I saw two. Mm -hmm. like I, so I'm like, like looking out. It took me. It took me a minute to rec to, to kind of and remember what a cock and hen is. And it's, it's been like, so long, right? It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what it is, but I suspect that they used to feed on whatever the mealybugs used to feed on because mm. when you cut down on and everything to the mealybugs is when I think they disappear. Mm -hmm. I mean, I the, our, our yeah used to have a lot of mealybugs too, so probably, you know. And when that happened and everybody cut down everything, the slugs went away and the cock and hens went away too. I think slugs like hibiscus too, I suspect. Yeah. But there goes the bush, as I was just telling you, there goes mm. the bush masquerading as a residential area, right? Mm -hmm. It looks it looks very residential, depending on where in Digo you are. But you are always one step away from the bush. Everywhere I have lived in Digo, we have had the full complement of wildlife from mm -hmm. snakes coming up. And right now, I have so much wildlife that they're not even keeping each other in check. The lizards, the spiders, and the frogs, all of them doing so well because they have so much food. All of them eating their belly full. They're not even competing. And on top of that, they're not keeping the mosquitoes in check. So clearly, no, nobody keeping mosquitoes in check. No, and then have a pomerac outside the window, so you know the bats and the birds and the pomerac tree fighting each other. Mm. For pomerac would not eat the damn mosquitoes. 
Mm-hmm. Before I fall in the lime in my, my sink, making a set of noise, but I still get in bite. I find if you want a lime in my kitchen, that is cool, but you need to keep them. You know? keep dealing with mosquitoes. The mosquitoes seem like they have, like they have a mind of their own these days. Mm-hmm. They a strength of their own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, look, cutie Ross, boy. Yeah, cutie rich. <laughs> Mr. Ross. <laughs> So what um, things we talking, John? So what, things we, what things we talking? Let, let me let me start. Let me start the ball rolling for those who don't know who he is. Let me start with the complimentary. You know, mm-hmm. it's a little sharp water. Let me let me get on to the the crooks. <laughs> um. Okay, I don't even know what to say to that. I am. I'm a writer. I'm a performer. I am. Uh. Well, actually, that kind of covers it. Once I say performer, right? I'm mm-hmm. a director, yeah, writer, performer, director, teacher sometimes. Yeah. I dance a lot. <laughs> because I can I I, sw- I swore you was a choreographer, you know. And I, okay. you know, I was like okay. So a lot of people think that I choreograph, right? Because I mm-hmm. dance a lot, I perform a lot, and because they know that I also write and I direct, I think that people just kind of assume that I assume. choreograph well. Mm-hmm. I have I have choreographed twice. I may end up doing it again at some point, but it's not the thing that calls me. Dance calls me as a dancer, not mm-hmm. as a choreographer. I I love dancing. I love I love movement. Um, and I love it in a way that makes me not want to think about it. That's why I don't choreograph. Oh, I just the... I don't want to think about dancing, right? The mm. only thing I think about when I'm dancing is my actual body and what my body is doing and how I can do that better. That's the only thoughts I have when I'm dancing. It's all just physical feeling and emotional feeling and I don't have to think. And if I were going to choreograph, I would have to think about it. And for me, that kills somebody joy. It's more, it's more structural, you know. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm happy to be in a body for other choreographers to present their work to the world. I love doing mm. that. So Interesting. I, yeah, I, I will always dance as long as my body lets me because I love it, even though I don't want to choreograph. The couple times I've choreographed, the two times it was both character based um, because I write and I direct and I act. If I am called upon to choreograph something for a character, I'm pretty comfortable mm. doing that because I treat that, I actually approach that as an actor, not as a dancer. Right? Mm. I am, I am using the dancer's toolbox in terms of the verbal, sorry, in terms of the physical vocabulary. But even though I'm using the dancer's toolbox of physical vocab, the mental work is is acting and directing. I'm saying, mm. how would character do this? You know? Okay. Um, but it, so did I, you? When I have to do it in that scenario, I'm cool with that. But that's mm. really the limits of me choreographing. But did you formally study dance, or is just something that you? Well, actually, I shouldn't say I did formally like that. I did, when I was doing my degree, I did a minor in dance. So my degree Mm. is not in dance specifically, it's in performance, but Mm. I did have a dance focused part of Mm. my education. Okay. Of course, I danced here my whole life. I started dancing here when I was like six, and I danced all the way through. And then when I got to university, I continued. And like I say, I did a minor. the particular university I went to offered dance as a minor for undergrad, and then they offered a master's and beyond, but they did not offer it. They did not offer a bachelor's, bachelor's in, dance. in dance. So I became like the darling of my department because I was a willing body that was fully trained and wasn't doing the program they were doing. So I was free to be the body in the rehearsals and in the performances. Mm-hmm. So I dance non-stop for that degree because everybody who's doing the masters and beyond, they're there primarily doing choreography. Doing and so they do bodies. So the dancers like me who are there because we love it and are doing a minor in it and our, our actual degrees in performing arts or something else, mm-hmm. then you know become their course. So I danced constantly and I was taking classes with people who were doing masters and whatnot and beyond. Mm. Yeah. So you say dancing since you were six. So now mm-hmm. we covered dancing. Why why acting and performing? Why why get um, into it was an accident? Um 
I was taking the dance classes already, and one day my father was late picking up me and my sister from the dance class that we had that day. And mm -hmm. we were the touring dance in a Caribbean school of dancing on Dare Street. And Noble Douglas used to rent out the front studio to Lilliput Children's Theater. So mm -hmm. we were there killing time after class, waiting on my father to pick us up. And there was a Lilliput drama class going on in the front studio. So we were standing up in the doorway, Marco in the class. The teacher at the time, Brian Richardson, um, saw me in the doorway and was like, what are you doing? You're not doing anything? Okay, good. Come and make yourself useful. These girls in this corner over here being butterflies and somebody's missing today. So fall in, find out from them what they're doing and you do that. And I was like, oh, okay. And I went in the corner and fall in with the girls and I was a butterfly or whatever the hell they were doing. And by the time my father came for me, I jumped in the car and I, and I was a child. I didn't have any sense of these lessons costing something. Mm -hmm. I jumped in the car and I was like, I want to do drama classes. And you know, my parents supported that, and so I did. And then um, from that, Brian Richardson left Lilliput in about a year or so, and John Isaacs became the drama teacher. Mm -hmm. And John, John is my heart. John, um, about a year after he took over teaching drama, Lilliput used to do, Lilliput does a show in Queen's Hall every year at yeah. a performance school. And um, when I came in, the way it used to work is that the adults would write the show and cast the show and direct the show and the Lilliputians would perform. Mm -hmm. And John basically walked up to me a day after class and he was like, Bartels, you have a way with words. Look a story outline and a list of characters. Take this home, write a script and bring it back next week. And I was like, okay. And because John said, do it. I did it. I didn't think about the fact that writing a play was hard. I didn't think about anything. What I knew was John said, I know you can do this, so do it. And so mm -hmm. I did it. And yeah. I even actually did it in a night because, of course, as a regular, you know, student, I, I hated school. I did not deal up in homework at all, never did it. And so what really happened is that on Friday afternoon when I came home from dance, well, Friday evening when I came mm -hmm. home from dance, I was like, shit. I need to have a play when I reach drama class tomorrow. So I wrote it the Friday night and took it to class on Saturday. And John was like, this is great. And that was the show we did in Queens all that year. Mm, wow. Yeah. Just yeah. like that. I was so you, so you, you, any, you, you any deep end? Yeah. Basically. I, but you didn't, you didn't study that water you was going in. What's you that? I say you threw any deep end, but you didn't study that it was water you was going in. Not at all, because John say go. And if John mm -hmm. say go, then I know it's good to go, right? So I went. I, I and remember. Yet, I suddenly went, oh, shit. I was writing plays when I was 11. That's hard. Mm -hmm. And then I got scared. Like, I only got scared and thought of it as difficult. After, in hindsight. In hindsight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because um, yeah. I, I remember John, though. I remember John. Um, my mom used to work. BWIA. Hey, on, Sunset House. Yes, he used to work Sunset House, and John used to work there. And With the lovely he, coil up on top of his head. Yes, my mom and John, but I was very young. So I was, let's say, I was in, I was in secondary school. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, well, that was my connection. I, I think he died not too long after, or when Blue, after Blue take off, took off. You yeah, know. John died. Um, John died after that. Um, Sunjet House was when I was in high school, and John died when I was in university. See, I, I realize I'm trying to do the maths here, right? Because <laughs> I'm trying to remember when I knew John and when you knew John to see if, you know, the maths maths. Yeah, I, I, when, I was, when I was in teenage angst years, mm -hmm. and was like, oh my God, my mother's such a bitch, I need to run away from home. Mm -hmm. John, I was the man the man who put up with all my teenage angst and talked me out of running away from home and and got me to understand that my mother wasn't as heinous a bitch as i thought and uh, hey john <laughs> john put up with plenty so he did was, not 15 year old me so was john your connection so because i want to because i, I kind of fast forward into what i wanted to ask for that don't so was john your connection to to to, to warren man and, and them or so John came in to teach Lilliput, and a couple of years into that, he brought in Warren Mann. And from what Warren Mann tell me, John decided that was happening. John informed Warren Mann, I believe, that he was coming to teach Lilliput. And mm -hmm. so um, 
yeah, I had John for a couple of years and then Warren Mann joined and that became my my home. That's that is my mentor is John and mm -hmm. Warren Mann. Yeah. Okay, that's I mean that's of, a... course, of course I, I do have other mentors. Um mm -hmm. I would definitely say like Pat Rowe at Caribbean School of Dancing was probably the first the first person to give me that love of performing and to make me feel like I could do it, you know. Mm. Yeah, so and then seemed, man continued that. So it seems like theater and performance arts and that kind of thing was like a, a getaway for you. So you, how would you answer, like, um, you think local theater and culture is kind of very important for, like, society and the youth, something to escape or this? Absolutely. And not just for escape. I think that, that theater and the arts in general is important for every society too, not just not just local society, mm -hmm. but I do think every society needs exposure to its local arts and artists, as well as foreign slash international wherever. But the arts are important for, I think, just keeping us human, you know? Mm -hmm. There is a lot that we as human beings need to learn and to be reminded of even after we've learned. It is really important, I think, for developing empathy, which is one of the things that we as a world population need more than anything else. Wow. Um, the arts is also about thinking. It's, 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 tell me, what were you about to say? Uh, so we are truly lacking empathy as, as people. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's highly yeah. noticeable of late. Mm -hmm. We need empathy. We need the critical thinking. We need the willingness to experiment and take risks. We need to remember that play is important. All of these things, arts are vital, I think. And it's really unfortunate that many societies and ours especially tend to take the arts for granted. Trinidad and Tobago really and truly takes the arts and artists for granted. Maybe because we are too blessed. Maybe mm -hmm. because every Trinbagonian thinks that it's easy, that anybody could jump up and do it. Um, you know, we, we lack a, a sense of real appreciation for and fostering education in and of the arts, you know? And yet, in a moment like this, when everybody in lockdown was the first thing everybody is turning to for their escape, for their mental health, for an ease, is the arts, right? Mm. And artists are expected to keep creating somehow. Somehow just keep creating. And right? don't expect, like, you know, payment for it. Or, no, it's a payment, because a lot of artists do it because they love doing it, but I mean, yeah, we do it because or, or appreciation, you know. Love, we definitely do it because we love it, but we also need to eat. Yeah, if I eat don't pay rent, I can't write and I can't dance neither. Mm -hmm. I can't teach those gremlins in my drama class neither. You know what I mean? So I would love to see a more universal appreciation for the earth. Some countries do better than we do. Um, and I do think that that we have a very particular problem of being able to take the arts for granted because we are such a creative people. I really do think that's a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And part of all, as much as I love it, also tends to train people who live here to treat with the arts as being disposable. Even mm. if it is appreciated, it is often treated as disposable because we see that, right? You wear, you pay the money for, and Costume. somebody or somebody's put in a huge amount of many hours of hard work to create this beautiful stunning work of art for us to go and parade in the drain and then throw by the side of the road when we finish you know what i mean and and i i i'm not against that because that is the nature of carnival itself mm -hmm. but i do think that it kind of bleeds over into how trinbagonians treat with the arts in general that sense of disposability you know mm. but yeah. just talking about you but will you miss will you miss the carnival like how will how's i your how are you feeling on the carnival? Um, okay, well, that's a broader question than will I miss it. So mm -hmm. I will I will start with this. When when March 12th happened earlier this year and I heard that we were going into lockdown, I immediately thought ahead to Carnival 2021 because that's me, right? Um, and so one of my first, first thoughts actually was, ooh, this is going to be exciting 
because the way that carnival has evolved there are certain things that are at the forefront right now that may not have been in many years gone by and there are other things that used to be at the forefront that are getting left behind there are certain arts and artists that we are losing before we have a chance to pass on knowledge and really build an appreciation in generations mm. coming up all of that all of that all of that right and so what i thought was that us being in lockdown would be a massive reset I thought this is going to be so cool because Carnival is going to be forced to be this very stripped down, back to basics, very rootical, community based thing. And I mm. thought this would be very good for our festival in terms of reconnecting with certain roots and, and figuring mm. out where we want the festival to grow and go next. Because one element of the festival, the sort of party, element of it has built itself and done very well but the rest of our festival is not um is not what what's what's the expression i want it's not in that same zone it hasn't been able to push the way that the party element has there's a lack of resources and all manner of things some people would like to say a lack of interest i think there's more lack of awareness that it is there more than anything else but but so the idea of us being in lockdown instantly made me go, this is going to be an exciting mm -hmm. switch to see what people come up with when they are forced to be more self-reliant and figure out the kind of themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and knowing that the things that usually happen will literally not be able to happen, so there will be a vacuum to be filled. I thought that was real exciting. And that was my mm -hmm. first thought as soon as we went into lockdown before anybody else started talking about what will this mean for Carnival. So that's how I feel about it because now I think everybody has accepted that this is where we are. Lockdown is what it is. Carnival will not be happening the way it has happened in recent years. And so now that everybody else has come around to that, I'm really excited to see what presents itself come Carnival 2021. Well, you think it would happen though, knowing Knowing that we sometimes, as so what, citizens, what do you get, what do you ask in if it will happen? Like people will be creative and people will do stuff on their own and or. Yes, I believe. I do believe that. I have no sense of what the numbers will be, but mm. I believe people will create. There okay. will be some sort of something at the ground level. I believe, because mm. to me that is the nature of carnival and the people that celebrate it for real, for real. Okay. Um, like I say, I have no sense of what the numbers will be like. Um, I have no sense of what the scale will be. I have no sense of if it will even remotely resemble what we are accustomed to, you know. Mm. Um, but I'm excited to see what happens. The, you know, the, I, I'm anticipating some something small on the ground and then whatever people who have the resources can bring virtually, mm. you know. Okay. Um, I'm looking forward. Did you can ask? Should we get up? You getting something virtually? Or you, you I can't speak. No one to ask. I cannot speak to that. Um, <laughs> I, no, I really don't know. I really don't know. Um, okay. To be honest with you, the Three Canal show is very much a show that is of the moment, right? Mm -hmm. The show is not something that Warren Man plans a year in advance. It's not like how carnival bands work, where as you get one up, you're already working on the one for next year. That's not how it is. We usually start talking about the carnival show very casually, like now so. Mm -hmm. And when I say casually, I mean super casually, isn't it's just in his head, it's just an idea. There is no script. And it may not even be being discussed widely. This would be me and him just having regular conversation and saying, you know, where's your head at? And then like, cause it's only the beginning of November. So then December is when his idea for the show will be more evident to those of us who work on the show. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of December, we know what the official concept is and we can hit the ground running with rehearsals in January. But we who are in the show, do not usually know anything about it really until the new year begins mm. prior to that it's in warren man's head it is conceptual um and so because it's only the beginning of november i ain't even i ain't even pick his brain yet to see where he's at with that stuff we've been talking mm. about other things because it, it ran it ran through my mind the other day i was like that is something that could be done very you know virtual and um it could, it, it could 
but that depends on the show, right? Because the yeah. show is of the moment, the show is based on what he is feeling and hearing and mm. seeing and what the mood is on the ground in Trinidad and Tobago right now. So, mm -hmm. you know how some shows will lend themselves better to a virtual scenario than others will? Mm -hmm. I, what I would say is that there's no way of telling right now if the show idea that presents itself will be one that lends itself to that so, or not. That kind that is, of and that, that is something that only he can, can really speak mm -hmm. to, you know. I don't know if his brain is even in that zone. I don't know if he's even having show ideas right now. Like I said, I haven't been asking him about that. We've been talking about other things when we speak. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as a process, it would have to be that he would have to have an idea that he wants to pursue. And then further to that, he would have to figure out how to make that idea viable in these times. And that, which is which is one of the, 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 trick, the trickiest parts in this whole... You know. And then also remember, he is a creative person himself, and he mm -hmm. may be wanting to use this time to make changes for himself. Maybe he wants to focus his attention and energy elsewhere. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. That, that's the nature of this right now, too. Everything got stopped in its tracks. Everything that we have been doing and are accustomed to doing literally came to a standstill, at least those of us in the arts in particular. Complete standstill. And so this is a moment where I know that several of my friends in the arts are taking the time to say, is this what I want to be doing going forward? If not, what do I want to be doing going forward? If and this I'm, is what I want to be doing going forward, how do I do it going and forward? Me and, me and you have had this conversation about, you know, about, exactly about that, that. So that, yeah. But so, um, it, it's hard to say basically what might come or not come of a three canal show because I don't even know if that is in the cards, so mm -hmm. to speak. You know. And are you writing and directing anything? You know, no. Well, I'm writing so that I have things to direct. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I am writing. Um, I was so I. I'm not even sure how long ago, a year ago, two years ago, something. So within the last three years. I wrote a play called Water More Than Flower that I very much like. It might be one of my favorite things I've ever written. And when I wrote it in the moment, I did not know what it was going to be at first. Mm. And as soon as I finished it in my head, I suddenly went, oh my God, this is not just the play. This is a collection of stories I want to tell. Mm -hmm. So Watermelon and Flower was the first installment of a collection that is, at least for me, called All of Our Shadows. Mm -hmm. And I've been working on, well, other installments of that. Um, I have two currently in process and ideas for a couple others. Um, and I kind of pressed pause on that collection to work on Crick Crack for Bocas, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and, and so now I'm back into those plays um, mm -hmm. and... Basically, I just want to finish, get the scripts finished so that we have work, you know, I, I want to I want to be making work that I love. Um, and so Which is important. That, I have to create the scripts to make that happen, then so mm -hmm. be it, you know. Yeah. All right. But um, I know you did some stuff with BBC, um, was last year. That was the uh, Watermelon and Flower. That was the Watermelon and Flower, okay. Yeah, what had happened was that I was writing, well, let me back this up. I have been writing this play called Jabless Diaries for years, like years, like never finish. Like this is, this is like my pet project. It is very much of my heart. It is something that I want, but it is conceptually very complicated. And I have not been able to put it on a page in a way that works yet. I thought I had done so a couple of years ago. And then when I had people try to read it out loud, I realized it was still too conceptual, still too cerebral. And I needed to, to do something different, right? So I have this jobless diaries thing that I've been sitting on and it's been bubbling for all of these years and not coming to fruition. But I know that the larger bless as a character is something that I am very attached to and enamored of and want to explore. So mm. at some point, I was like, you know what? You're being too precious with his jobless diaries. The reason you're not finishing it is exactly that. You're being too precious. You're being too much of a perfectionist. And you're just here, like, combing over this with a fine-tooth comb and not actually making anything better or clearer for your audience. You're just playing mm. with ideas in your head. 
you need to rest this. Walk away and come back. So I said, right, I go in and write something else. I don't know what the fuck, but I go in and write something else. So I put on Jabla's Diaries and I started writing this other play. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the play was called, it, it was just a Wasserman story, right? How this came about was, when, where I grew up in my parents' house in Digo, there has been water sharing my entire life. Is mm -hmm. In that at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, water goes and it comes back at 6 a.m. Tuesday, mm -hmm. Thursday, Saturday. And our understanding is that the people up the hill, when we have water, they do have. They like, don't have you water. Know, so everybody by us has a tank so that when water goes at that 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., you have your mm -hmm. tank, right? But for somebody like me with this hair, knowing when water goes, when you're being a dancer five days a week makes a difference because when you come home hot and sweaty on the night that you want to wash these dreadlocks, you want to know if it have water or not, right? Mm -hmm. So I was very, like, very on top of that schedule. And I went off and lived in the States for 10 years and came back and whatever, whatever. And I was back in my parents' house and I suddenly felt like, what's a fucking with the schedule, right? I go into my rehearsal on a Wednesday and I come home Wednesday night. I expect to be able to wash my hair Wednesday night. Why the fucking hand water? I, I was very distressed about the fact that I wasn't on top of the schedule. I had an uncle who used to work wasa. So I say, Uncle Wayne, what's your real scene with this, with this water thing? Like, is it that... Is it that the system is screwy and, and people, or, or is it that you guys don't even have a system and it's still a manual thing and fuckers just not turning up to work to turn the mm. water on? What is it? And Uncle Wayne explained to me that the shutting off of water is a completely manual thing still. There is mm. no automated system that just does it. And so, yes, if somebody does not turn up to work, you could be left without your, without your water being turned back mm. on. But further to that, the turning it off and on is something that anybody can do. There is a specific tool, though. But therefore, once you know where the shutoff is, mm -hmm. and you could get the WASA office to access this specific tool, then any and everybody could shut off water, right? And I was like, what? This is crazy. And then, I, and then he said that, you know, you can get really specific about it. And I was how specific? Think about an area like Diamond Vale, right? Where you have, mm -hmm. it's an entirely residential area and the houses are laid out on the street. I was like, could I shut off water to half of one of the streets in Diamond Vale? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, way. So if I decided that I didn't like somebody and I wanted to fuck with their life, I could just go and be shutting off their water. And he kind of gave me a look. <laughs> and the story was born, right? So I, in my head from that conversation, had this idea that there's this man who is working Oasa and is convinced that his gal is haunting him. And because she <laughs> him, and he is determined to try and keep this gal home, what mm -hmm. he starts doing, anytime she says she's going online with the girls when she come home from work, he's shutting off the water so she can't be, right? This was the idea that I had. So the Oasa man is playing around in my head. And so when I decided to rest Jabla's diaries, I was like, ah, I'm going to write this Oasa man thing. Cool. I thought I was writing it as a story, not as a play. But when I started writing this story, I felt like I needed to get into the relationship tension of why this man would resort to shutting off the water instead mm. of just talking to this girl, right? Like, what the hell is wrong with him? And so in thinking about the tension of their relationship, then I realized, no, this is a play. This is not a story. Well, I mean, it is to be written as a play yeah, and yeah. not a fiction. So I started writing this play. And when I started working on the play, the place that I started from was I wanted to start from an argument. I wanted to write a scene that was them fighting that would lead to him choosing to shut off the water. Mm -hmm. So I started writing this play, right? And I'm enjoying writing it. I have, I have not, at that point in time, I hadn't written something like relationship tension like that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of fun and I was really liking it. And what I determined was that the reason he thinks she's haunting her, uh, the reason he thinks she is haunting him is that she is keeping a secret, but the secret is not another man, right? The secret is that she is taking a course because she wants to better herself and she wants to, she wants to, to start up a side hustle that could eventually become her main hustle because she mm -hmm. feels like stagnant in her life. 
both her job and the relationship because he's her first boyfriend. They're together since high school. She went from living in her parents' house to living with him. She knows no other life. So the secret is just that she's trying to take this course and start up this side hustle, but she hasn't told him. And therefore he feeling the secret being kept thinks that this is a haunting, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm writing the play and I realize, okay, so she's taking this course. And then I got stuck because I couldn't decide what she was taking the course in and mm -hmm. why. And one night I went to sleep thinking about what she was taking the course in and dread this idea literally wake me up out of my sleep like make me sit up in my bed at four o'clock in the morning out of nowhere she's a larger bless i was supposed to be leaving the larger bless thing alone mm. the idea that came to me is that she was taking this course to be uh to become a private detective because she has learned that she is a larger bless who has been suppressing that her whole life mm. and she is deciding that she is now going to explore this part of her so the point of the side hustle is since what we know about the larger bless is that she has sex with a man and then either kills him or he loses his mind and wanders off to, to mm. meet his end her thing is then what i need to do is choose carefully so i will use the private investigative skills to do the research to choose men with resources and no dependents and then i will approach the man as larger bless have the sex once i take the bull kill the man and take all the resources right this is a brilliant side hustle mm -hmm. and so i then realized well clearly you're still writing the larger bless thing mm -hmm. in a very different way so, and you, so you merge everything together in this and then right as i figured out this thing that she was a larger bless like two days later i see bbc call for scripts for radio plays and i was like well this wasn't intended to be a radio play but i could make it a radio play why the hell not because i was still finishing it it wasn't done yet mm -hmm. i think um, you asked that last year yeah, yeah right when we were sitting in carry fest in the box yeah. Mm. Yeah, so at that point, they and they just wanted to see a scene or two. So I was like, sure. And I sent a scene or two, and they really liked it. And they were like, yes, do it. And so I did it. So I wrote the script as a stage play and then like looked up how you format a radio play. And, and the person that the BBC had working with us helped a lot with that too. She sent me a lot of resources in terms of making it a radio play as opposed to a stage play. Mm -hmm. And we did that. And by the time I was done with it, I was like, yeah, this is a collection. There is more. There yeah, because is more. Because, I mean, just listening to the story, right, you know, I get really interested in defining how, how this whole thing, because it turned from relationship tension into a kind of horror using folklore. You know, it, it, it's a real nice hybrid, and I would really love to hear the rest of this story. Oh, wait, that's right. You didn't get to hear it because no, I didn't get, to, it. I, I didn't get, I didn't get to hear it. No, I didn't get to hear it. Oh, dude, I can't lie. It's one of my favorite things that I've written, and so I totally am mm. saying up front. I talking up this play. I think it's fucking great. No, no, no. The idea um, alone, I like the idea alone is is, is, is fucking amazing. You know what I mean? Thank you. I I really I, I really like the idea. Like when it woke me up, I was like, "This is it!" And I and I finished writing that play, and I instantly started having ideas for more. So mm. now in the collection, there is um, a Lagoo story. There is a Sukuya story. There is a possible point of connection where the Sukuya and Lagoo may come together. Because the Sukuya is a, a scientist, and the Lago who is trying to solve his problem, mm -hmm. um, and when he meets the, he meets her, thinking it's a date, and when she says she's a scientist, he's like, "Huh, maybe this could help me," and so he decides to snatch her, and only upon snatching her and explaining to her why he has snatched her, does she then explain to him, "Well, you have a problem because I'm a superior, so this is not going to go down the way you think." So that's the one that I'm in the middle of right now. So, so let me let me find out something. What is going on in your head sometimes? Ooh. Too much, all kind of thing, everything, all at the same time. Because <laughs> I mean, to think up all of that. I mean, but how important is using like natural, or not natural, local folklore in 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 telling of your stories or telling stories? I love our folklore. I think we have such great folklore, and I've wanted for many years to do something with it. I think that's where Jabless Diaries, the initial thing was born, mm -hmm. was because years ago, so I was in the States for 10 years. When I came back in 08, 
Lilliput, of course, I went straight back to Lilliput. Lilliput did so much for me that as soon as I was back in Trinidad, I knew I was going to go and teach at Lilliput. So I went straight back to the studio. And within the first couple of years that I was back, Lilliput did a show called Lagahoo. And the way that we work, so my I said when I came in, the adults were writing the show. And then mm -hmm. John had me writing the show. So for the years that I was a member of Lilliput, all through my teens, I was a resident playwright and I wrote the plays. When I graduated out of Lilliput and went off to the States to do university, they they basically Warren Man was was working with the people who were still in Lilliput, and the show would be would be generated by a combination of his efforts and their efforts. He would pull from them, get the material out of them, and then craft it into a script kind of thing. Right? Mm. So so that means that whatever the show concept is, the gremlins that we teach have to do a certain amount of research on the topic. That's part of the process. It means that they learn about whatever it is. So when we do a climate change show, they go and do all our research and learn all about climate change. When we did a street children's show, they actually did research and talked to young people who were living on the streets in this country and, and did mm -hmm. that work, right? So we come to do Lago Who Now? And we sit down in the room and I suddenly realize none of my gremlins know anything about our local folklore. Like I'm throwing out names and they're like, well, the names of the characters are vaguely familiar, right? Everybody's heard the word Sukuya, but they didn't know anything. And so when I said to them, okay, your homework is go home, talk to your parents, your grandparents, tante, nene, and uncle, everybody. Talk to all the people in your family first. Ask them what they know. After you talk to people, then you are allowed to go online and Google it, right? So they came back the week later with all their stories and they were so excited because they had no idea. And when their grandparents tell them thing about how, you know, what you have to do is you have to take off your panty and put it on inside out. And you have to, you know, all, all the different little things that you could do to try and ward off particular jumbies and, you know, the spreading of the rice or the salt or the sand mm -hmm. for the sand. And how you and how you have to put the dog yampy in your eye and look through the keyhole and they were like what they had no clue and i just well, felt so bad for them that they had been missing out on all of that and didn't even know they were missing out so from I had, then i knew that i wanted to dig up in our folklore and bring our folklore into the contemporary so that mm -hmm. it wouldn't be that thing that if your grandparents didn't mention it you don't know i wanted mm -hmm. everything to know and i wanted to bring it into the now and that's a big part of why Water More Than Flower is one of my favorite things I've written because I think it does that so well. It mm -hmm. takes that less legend and brings it completely into the right into now. The new, new age kind of vibe. In a because very she, practical she, way. She, you know? she dated a wasaman and she, she wants to be a detective you know I mean? to make, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Cause I mean, that's, them stories did the total opposite to me when I was young. Mm -hmm. Them stories, cause I, I have a primary school teacher, my um, standard five teacher, Mr. Attali. Like he would come and he would tell these stories about Sukunia and Natural Bless and thing, but very ominous now. Like he would talk like this and he would, you know. Scary story business. Like, yeah, scary story business. And I would sleep with my sister for years. Like, I you can't sleep by myself. I was, I couldn't sleep by that's myself. Great, though. But you that know? is great because that's what's supposed to happen, right? I that's good. Sleep. I couldn't I mean, sleep I'm sure you didn't myself. enjoy it at the time, right? You didn't enjoy mm. not sleeping, but but that's a part of it, right? Mm. That's what those stories were for. It was about, you know, telling little children certain things to make them behave and stay inside and not mm. talk to strangers and telling men about being faithful so the larger blessed don't come for you. Like, mm. stories are supposed to be kind of scary. That's the like part I, of it. Like if not a rumor, like my grandmother was a Sukunia, like that, like that stuff. Like so, here when I was growing up, you know. When like, you told me that during Carifesta, horse, that kind of split my head open. Just because even as somebody who's digging up in our folklore all the time, mm -hmm. I've never known a person directly who other people were absolutely convinced is yeah, is yeah. or a larger bless or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I have met people who other people suspect might be mining a buck, but mm -hmm. that's about as close as it gets. I cannot say that I've ever met a person that is considered to be. So when you told me that, that set my head going. I was just like, what is it like to live that life where mm -hmm. everybody suspects you of being this malignant? Yeah, but she, she was a person. She was kind of badass and, you know, she 
she didn't show hold up water in her mouth and she was she would cuss anybody and that kind of thing. So she didn't really didn't care. You know? Um but yeah, that was the rumor as a young man I know and you know, people kinda of talk that so when I named my album Sita Grandson because of her and and because you people used to say you see that you see that grandson thing and you know they'll say like thing she has so you know that's my I connection hope, to I hope she power from that that's what i hope i hope that mm. she drew power from the fact that people mm. were scared yeah. you know you know yeah, you so know this is going to turn up in a story someday right at some point i'm going to be messaging you to be like just so you know <laughs> i just wrote a thing um i'm gonna send it for you to see because no no, no there's no problem come up because I think it's really, I find that a fascinating idea to be the mm. person themselves that is living that life whether you actually are or are not but to be mm -hmm. perceived as you know mm -hmm. like since you told me that I've been turning over this idea of somebody who isn't at all the malignant folklore character people think they are but mm. that there are a lot of coincidental things and things. circumstances like it, could be a, like it could be a comedy too now like you know what I mean yeah because just kind of see them yeah 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 i get it i get it make it you kind of make me interested in writing though uh-huh like, really thought about it like i never really thought about Do it. Yeah, really thought about writing Do because I, I can write in small bits like you know, i can write writer. i can write in small bits but like to write a play you know i never really thought about it no. like a story or a play like i had this idea to do uh production i think i talked to rockers about it um about doing a show with singing and stuff like that but i'm telling a story of this mm -hmm. this this guy so i'm kind of telling a story of this this person and um i'm telling story from the, the time he wakes up to the evening right mm -hmm. and i'm Absolutely. using i'm using a daily life of this this dude but i'm using songs from four artists david rudder I think Fela Kuti, Nina Simone, and somebody else. I think it was um, Maestro or something like that. So I wanted to actually write the story first and then pick the songs after putting in. To, Sorry, you know, I'm just, for, just to say something real quick. Remind me, I have a request. As you say songs, right? Mm -hmm. I have a request before this before this conversation is over. Continue. Yeah, so that was the plan. That was actually some plan a couple of years ago. I wanted to actually write this. So I actually started writing He Wakes Up, and I, I think that's why I stopped. He wakes up and I kind of, you know, <laughs> so but I really had to get back into that because I think the idea came to me and I think like it, this, and I've never seen it done like that. Or I mean, never a suggestion. Seen that. Just mm -hmm. a suggestion. If what happened is that you wrote that he wakes up and then you kind of stick there, do not assume that you have to write it in the order that it appears in the end. You can mm -hmm. write whatever part you want first. So oh. I would think that jump in by writing the parts that are most exciting to you mm -hmm. and then you can just connect those bits you know what I mean? oh yeah. okay 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 if you, if you have an idea of a scene where there's a lot of tension or a scene where something exciting is going on mm -hmm. or a scene that is specifically descriptive and you want to get that description out of you mm -hmm. write those parts and just leave the space for the stuff that you need to fill in to connect it yeah and then you will go back and fill in all that stuff you know another yeah. way to operate just as an idea um when you want to write um let's say you're trying to write a script whether it be radio play stage play screenplay musical mm -hmm. whatever if you're trying to write a script if you have an idea of how you want the thing to play out but you don't know yet about the specifics an, a good way to work, I have found, is to literally bullet point your story, right? So let's say the story is this dude wakes up, he has a meeting, he learns something in the meeting that changes his life, he rushes to the airport and books a ticket. Let's say mm -hmm. that's what it is, right? So you write those bullet points. He wakes up, he goes to work, he whatevers, he whatevers. And then go through and, and just select whichever of the bullet points is calling to you the most at that point in time and write that scene. Mm -hmm. So then you have the, the three bullet points that start and a fleshed out scene and then some more bullet points at the bottom and you basically just replace the bullet points with the stuff. With stories. Create the stuff. So the bullet points are like a, a framework for you to hang the story on. Mm -hmm. And and literally just every time you have enough of the idea to flesh out that part, 
go to that bullet point, write the thing. When the thing is written, you can delete the note that was the bullet point and just mm -hmm. leave it in that chronological place on your page. And then you go back and connect the dots. No, now you make me feel like I owe you some money for this lesson. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I owe you some money for this. Oh, yeah, I, this have a I have a request. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hope you have it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You should totally do it. Write it. Write the things. Mm -hmm. And I love to read. So if you write the things and you want somebody to take a read and tell you if it's engaging and give you a little feedback, please send it. I like to read. And I like to be local. Well, I mean, I never really, I don't know what it is, but I am now starting to get really interested in, in local stories. I'm, I'm you know, um, fascinated with not so much the culture, but, you know, how I can use the, use the culture to tell my stories in a sense. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, we have cultural but, forms. You know, and, um, so I mean, talk a lot about the arts and and your stuff. But what what are you tuning into outside of uh, your own stuff? I mean, like what movies. What am I and... tuning into? Um, to be honest with you, this lockdown period has been an overload for me. I feel like what happened is that we went into lockdown and all the artists went into overdrive. Everybody was like, "I need to create. I need to put content out there." And I feel like a lot of people put a lot of work out. And so in the early days, when I was trying to just see, I wanted, I, I'm always interested. I want to see what people are creating. And I very quickly was overwhelmed because there was just so much stuff, you know? And so now I have kind of fallen off. I've gotten to a point where I'm no longer trying to keep up. And I am trusting that if something is for me, it will, I will hear about it. It will penetrate the ether close enough for me to go, oh, there's a thing out there that I should check out. And then, mm -hmm. of course, you know, people who know me well, if they see a thing and it makes them think of me, they will, like, saying Cutie Ross, who was jumping up earlier in this conversation, is definitely one of those friends who knows me like that. Mm -hmm. Quincy Rose, when he is watching a certain kind of show, if it makes him think of me, he will hail me and tell me, hey, Dread, watch this show, ting, ting, ting. And he knows me well enough to be a good judge. He don't need mystery. When Q tell mm -hmm. me I would like a thing, usually he is right. So I have watched some very random things on recommendation. I have watched other very random things just because I like what I like. But there isn't anything that I would say I am following. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, there isn't. There, I can like when I think about what I've been taking in, it's it's one-off things. Like just yesterday, me and Q were talking about a show he had told me about very early in lockdown called Staged. It was literally six episodes that were maybe ten minutes long at best, but it was one of the best things that we have watched in the lockdown period. And we were just talking about how great that was, and you know, it's like that random, random things like that, where I watched this show and I thought it was good. I watched this performance and I thought it was good. But um, following is hard. I do try to, in terms of following, the one, the one entity that I am closest to following is probably Bocas, just because they've been doing a lot of things, a lot of interviews mm -hmm. and conversations. And I try to keep up, but even that, I have seen, I would say, less than half of what Bocas has put out. And that's with me actively trying to keep up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I, I feel like I'm struggling. You know what? Okay, so here's a random thing. I've been watching more recently, like in this last few weeks, I have gone back to old black and white Sherlock Holmes. Okay. I, I don't even know what happened. It was a random, you know how YouTube does that thing where you watch a thing and it's something I need to Mm -hmm. Yeah, I watched a Miss Marple a night. And from Miss Marple, I reached Poirot. And from Poirot, of course, Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes is my favorite of all of them anyway. But mm -hmm. you know, when you feel like you've already seen all of the stories of a particular franchise. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I wasn't seeking out the Sherlock Holmes. But the Marple and the Poirot led me to a Holmes that I was unfamiliar with. And I suddenly realized there were all of these random attempts over the years to make Sherlock Holmes television series that I didn't even know existed. So there are these real random, like one-off things, like a single episode 
where this particular actor is playing Sherlock Holmes and it's the only time that that ever happened because the pilot didn't get sold, like random mm. shit like that. So there's random black and white movies. Um, I also at one point briefly went back to Hitchcock, but I can't deal with the misogyny. I love Hitchcock's stories, but I am so tired of how he treats with women. And that also has been affecting me as well in terms of choosing content. There's a lot of content that even if I know that it is well made and I anticipate mm -hmm. that it will be good, right now I'm just not fucking in the mood. I am so fed up of white people's stories. I'm just fucking done, 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 done. It's not because it's bad. It's just because I'm in my 40s. It's, it's, That's it's, it's, my whole life. Like, come on. So there are, there are certain things now where somebody will say, oh, this was good. And I will say point blank, I believe you. I believe it was good, but I am not interested in watching it right now. Mm. I, am, I, am, I am very bored with white people's stories. I am fairly bored with standard straight male protagonists. I, you know, so, so that's the other thing right now. It takes a lot to get my interest and get me to really follow you. And then because I'm feeling the overload, even the shit that I do like and I am actively watching, I'm very behind on. I am a full season behind on Westworld, on Mr. Robot, on Handmaid's Tale, on any of yeah. those things that are more Me? current that I'm watching. I am so behind. I am behind you know? on all of them. Actually, I think I watched, I watched the first season of Westworld and I didn't tune in after that. And I was, My, meant, and I was meant to go back to it, but like, I don't know, it's where I'm watching it. It's good, it's worth going back to. But mm -hmm. you need brain space for Westworld too. Yes, and that's exactly, I feel it's been a bit that's too much. Good. Yeah, it's a, a bit too much sometimes to, to sit down and take in heavy stuff. Yeah. You know? I did watch Lovecraft. Um, that's one of the few things that I watched while it was happening, while everybody else was watching, because a lot of the time I watch things long after. Mm -hmm. um, I watched Lovecraft. But meanwhile, my Netflix list is long and keeps growing because they keep putting out content and I'm in overload mode and not watching. And my YouTube list is the same. It's growing and growing because content lockdown continues. And so people just keep uploading mm. content and the lists are getting long and I am not the watching. Thing, the thing about Lovecraft, I, I didn't tune in when everybody was tuning in. And I decided, okay, when is the season done, I'm going to start... Right, I saw that you put up a status about that. And I, I watched, it. I watched the first episode, and I was like, "You wasn't okay. feeling it." No, I wasn't feeling it. It was decent, but okay. like I was expecting so much more because ah, of the yeah, yeah, was going I, on. I will and, say this though about Lovecraft. I, I, I will suggest that you don't judge it just on episode one because I think the unfolding of the stories is important. Okay. To the overall appreciation of the show, I will say that for it, the unfolding of the stories is the key. Mm -hmm. So, okay. if you are playing and you have the brain space and the time, I would say go back and try the other. Episode. Yeah, I'll try that. I'll try that again because I mean the, the conversation. Be uh, I was watching the conversation. I was really excited, but about it, you know, I'm just it's like, all right, it's it definitely decent. sparked an interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am a very critical watcher. Um, when I watch, this is why my mother doesn't watch TV and movies with me because I can't stay out of my working brain and I have to critique all of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, for me, the performances in Lovecraft alone make it worthwhile. Even if you okay. don't like, even if you don't like that kind of story, story. Even okay. if you take issues with the particular stories that they told, even if you take issues with the characters that they built. I think that across the board, the performances were really good. Mm. And I enjoyed that very much. And I also enjoyed the continued normalizing of black people on big screen and mm. the continued normalizing of non-Hollywood um, non stereotypical bodies and faces. Oh, okay. oh nice. Like, there, there's a moment in there where um, one of the older woman, not old, but old enough to have a child already, mm -hmm. gets to experience other things. And so you get to see her dressed in ways other than she's usually dressed. And it just really struck me in the moment of watching that, that the normalizing of seeing her body in these other outfits was really enjoyable for me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting that there, but I enjoyed that. 
I'm, I'm, you know, I was saying I'm fed up of white people's stories and whatnot. I'm also fed up of stereotypical Hollywood. Black story. Like that shit really boring. Mm -hmm. Like I'm so fed up of that, that, that very standard perfection in the face thing that Hollywood enjoys. I don't fucking like it. I never mm -hmm. have. I actually have always found it boring. The people that I find attractive are hardly ever the people that mainstream finds attractive. I am usually attracted to those that are, for lack of a better word, weird looking or quirky mm -hmm. looking or whatever, because I prefer visual interest to conformity. Like, like mm. there was a point when Cameron Diaz was being considered really, really attractive. And I kept saying to people, Why? it's not that she's attractive, it's that she's completely bland. There's nothing happening in her face. You can also make up and make it anything. She could be good looking, she could be ugly, she could be anything because her face is like a blank fucking canvas. I find that so boring. I used to um, wonder what's the, the, the fascination with Karen Diaz, you know? I think it was the blank canvasness because when mm. they wanted her to be the female lead in movies, they were able to portray her as being hot girl next door type mm -hmm. because she has that blank canvas of a face. And she's willing to be silly, which allows her to play female lead in a certain type of movie. And so she was doing well with that for a minute. But I just use her as an example mm -hmm. of that kind of face that a lot of people seem to view as beautiful. And I'm looking at the face and being like, really? I would pass mm -hmm. that so straight in the road. There ain't none to watch there. Give me mm -hmm. Adrian Brody's nose over the boringness of Cameron Diaz's face any day. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're about noses. You see Atticus on Lovecraft? That is a sexy fucking nose. Oh my god. Yo, that man have nose. I like a black man with a nose, you know. Hey. It does look good with a nose. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. I um I I will say try try Lovecraft again. Yeah, Give it a will. chance to unfold some of the Probably storytelling. Watch one tonight if I don't fall asleep, which is usually my problem. Um, Why is that? Like, I would want to get to this question. I'm we kind of go back a little bit uh -huh. since, since I mentioned, you know, gender and, uh, and race and that kind of thing. But as a female director and actor, have you incurred any hurdles in Trinidad, or is you know, um, it's do people a, take you serious? It's an interesting thing, right? I think that I probably have, and I just didn't take it on. Mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate, very, very fortunate in my life that from a very young age, I managed to encounter the people who would be important to me, who would be my mentors, who would be with me, like Warren Mann. I met Warren Mann when I was 12. I met John when I was 10 or 11. You know, these are the people that really shaped me beyond my parents, of course, and, and have been not just mentors, but friends. And so because I've been really lucky to have that guidance and a very strong type of guidance that was at the same time very accepting and very open and very encouraging of me to be my own self freely mm -hmm. and also encouraged my growth by challenging me. Like the way that John said to me, look a script outline and some characters go home and write a script and bring it back. Warren Mann treats with me the same way. Eh? Warren Mann is just be like, yeah, I need you to do blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, all right, cool. And I go do that you know, and only after it's done do I really think about what we have just accomplished together with his idea and what he said to me and what, you know what I mean? So, um, because I have been encouraged in that way, I've been allowed to be myself very freely and I have been challenged to step up to work even before I was aware that I could do it. I therefore have a tendency to just be in the world. Like, I don't really give a fuck what people think about me or what they have to say about me. And so whatever negativity I have butted up against by being black and woman in this world, I have largely ignored and just run roughshod over and done what I do. Mm -hmm. I am sure that there are many gigs I don't get by being outspoken, opinionated, black woman, whatever. I am sure there are many people that avoid me and there are many gigs that I don't get, but I don't feel those things. What mm. I am aware of is working in the scenarios that I want to work in. I work with the people I like to work with and that's why I continue working with them. 
Mm-hmm. I hear um, and that's but, kind of an interesting thing too, in that it proves itself to me. There have been random occasions, and like we talked about the fact that people working in the arts often don't make a lot of money, right? Mm-hmm. So there have been occasions in my life where projects have come up that made me go, oh my God, I might actually stand to make some bank here. And this could be a little bit of a life changer for me in terms of providing financial stability and resources and stuff. And when those things have come about through projects that were with people outside of the people that I know I like working with, I find that I often am reminded of how I don't play well with others. Mm. I find it difficult. Um, and that is just my nature. I'm worth it though. I'm I'll difficult, tell, but I'll tell, us, I'll, I'll tell you a story when, when, when you're done. All right, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm difficult, but I'm worth it. So I mm-hmm. do good work, but I'm not for everybody. And mm-hmm. um, and I think that, that I therefore contribute to my own not reaching those levels of financial success that a lot of people think that one should be striving for. Mm-hmm. Because I am also that person who, in addition to knowing that I don't play well with others and seeing how that plays out in scenarios, um, there are also times where I have thought, oh, here's a project coming up. I think I'm going to throw my hat in the ring for that. And then I look at who else is working on it and I go, nah, and fucking working with us so and so. And I won't even send in my, my application or whatever. Mm. Um, and that is because I like what I like and I do what I do and I like to do what I like to do. And I am not good at compromising on that. I'm good at compromising on a lot of things but not my work, mm-hmm. you know? I will compromise as a person. I will compromise in relationships. I do not compromise well over my work. I will fucking fight for that. And so that's why I say I think I, I contribute to my own lack of financial success or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, but that, to come back to your initial question, because that is how I approach things. I am here to do what I do because that's what I like to do and that's what I'm good at. And if you give me room to do it, you will be pleased with the result. Therefore, people who have issues with me being an outspoken, opinionated, little black girl, well, they could sit on by that because I don't even have time to study them. I'm not even aware of them most of the time, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. And it's, it's interesting, you know, like you had Zara Gordon on. I think she might have been your first or second very early in this yeah. in this show running. Second, yeah. You had Zara on and it took me back to a moment that happened recently. When people, because people have been asking me this, right? As I'm getting older and people are starting to see my work a little bit more and see the commonalities in terms of what I like to address. I'm being asked to speak about being a woman, being a black woman in the arts. Um, and creating from that space and creating work that that centers women and also about women and sexuality and all of that. And a lot of the time when people come to talk to me about these things, I am at a loss because I don't actually think about it. I'm just out here doing and being. And what I am is on a certain level, I suppose, radical unto itself for some. But I'm just being and I'm not thinking about the difficulty of that or what it takes to do that. So like Zara was talking to me about Crick Crack and about the fact that when Merle Hodge published Crick Crack, she was the first black woman to accomplish something like that. And and she was, you know, looking to speak to me about that stuff. And I was like, holy crap, I wasn't even studying all that. When I worked on Crick Crack, you know what I was thinking about? This is a great fucking book. I love it. I am so excited for an opportunity to present this story to other people. Mm -hmm. Let me do this justice. Let me make the best quick crack possible. I wasn't thinking about the fact that when the book came out, Merle Hodge was groundbreaking by simply accomplishing that very thing. And so Zara comes to interview me about it. And all of a sudden, I am the worst interview subject ever because I couldn't give her a decent quote about it because Mm -hmm. I just think about it i really don't somebody was talking to me in a bogus thing about about the hungry woman that i write of the woman in my stories hunger for things and and they want and they go after what they want and i was like huh i didn't even think about that i write i i write from 
from what I have inside mm -hmm. of me. So I get, yeah, I write of hungry woman because I'm a hungry woman, maybe. But again, I'm not, I'm not thinking about it. So theoretically, it's hard to be a black woman doing what I'm doing. But I'm not thinking about that shit. I'm just right. doing things. Right. The, only, the only difficulty that I really think about is the financial thing because rent had to pay and mm -hmm. groceries had to buy. And that's a very real thing, especially right now. Mm -hmm. But what I what the, but outside of the moments where I am dealing with financial stress, all I really think about is making work that I think is good, mm -hmm. work that meets my standards, and work that speaks to the things that I am interested in. Because, like I said, I'm fucking fed up of white boy stories. I if, if I want to read other things, then I seek out other things, and then I create other things as well. You mm -hmm. know, so. It's not even an intentional, considered thing of I have these things to say and message, and it's not all that. I'm just doing, doing what I like to do. I like I to hear. read and I like to write and I like to dance, mm -hmm. and I'm good at those things. And that's one of the things. That's one of the things that I've admired watching you. Even when you dance, as you say, you kind of dance very freely, and you're in your own zone, and you. You take over the space and it's like nobody else is around, you know. And I, that's, that's how it feels when, when I am out and a DJ does their job well and mm. plays music that makes me want to dance. There is nothing else in the universe in that moment except I the just, music and what I'm feeling. Mm. And you know what I hate? I hate when I'm out and I'm feeling music and I'm dancing and somebody comes to talk to me. What the fuck you doing? Try to talk to me. Are you not seeing that I am in communion with music and the universe right now? And you want to fucking say hello? And hello, hello, until this song and this wine done. Mm -hmm. so like, I, yeah. I, I, get, I get lost in it. I've actually had times where a song would finish and I would look up and realize that I didn't know where I was. Mm -hmm. There have been months where no, I have to be very glad for the black box being the home that it is so that I can be myself that freely. Because when I'm in the black box and rockers spin them tunes and I dance, I know that I'm safe and I can lose myself in that music. And when the music finish and I look up and I don't even know where the fuck I am, I'm gonna be okay. Because it's mm -hmm. my people in my little corner of the world where it's safe yeah, to be yeah. now, you know? And then watch on this school. appreciate that. A little watch on this though could could work right now. Yes. Yeah, well, watch on the next spot, eh? The next spot for that. Mm -hmm. but you know what's hard for me? I, it's a sad thing, right? I have this um this difficult dilemma um that has already happened with Rockus and the Black Box and is happening with Wajang as well. And that is that as as we were just saying, I when I'm feeling the music and I want to dance, I am dancing and I am taking up all the dance floor that I want and I do care. I'm not aware of what else and who else is there. The unfortunate dilemma is that when the DJs or events that I love are doing yes, I also feel that way when somebody try to talk to me while I eat in roti quincy. I do, I do. Do not talk to me when I'm eating the roti nida. But um yeah, when, when the DJs or the events or the spaces that I like gain popularity, then I lose dance floor space. Mm. So in the early days of the Black Box, that was really my time because we were having events and Rockus was spinning and people were coming, but mm. there was still enough room for me. I would say that the last couple of times Rockus had a party in the Black Box, I didn't have space. To dance how I really want to, and so I don't get to enjoy partying like that the same way anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't be mad about that because I love Rockus and I want him to do well. And if the reason that I don't have space is that a bajillion more people are feeling him and wanting to pay their money and come and support his thing, then I'm happy for that and I'm happy for him. But I am mm -hmm. sad for him because I don't get that thing that I need anymore. And the same thing happening it's with Wajan. Wonderfulness, but it is also crowded enough mm. that there there'll be little little pockets of the night where I can really dance. But mm. I have not been able to just dance out the whole night like I used to in at least three years. 
because Roca's big now, eh? Not that he wasn't big then, but he is. He he has a, a what's the word? A clientele. That sounds like a weird way to describe yeah. party group. But, but Roca's, Roca's community has grown. I mm. can't. I think it's been at least three years since I really had space in a dance like that. Mm. You know, I well, I love the, the success for them, but I miss it. I miss. I, yeah. I miss well, I'll, I'll close with this story. You and Warren Man are responsible. I wouldn't say responsible because I was mad at y'all for a good bit of time. Yes, let me talk about this. And <laughs> I think I think you know the situation. I yes. think it was a it was a panel or some thing with music you know or what whatever. T T N. It was when that right. right. company existed. Right. And you know, and thing and it sound like John Legend, and that pissed me the fuck off. Like I hate I up to this day anybody say that I just be pissed. You know? Good. Be pissed. Do not let them compare you to John Legend. Yeah, and it made me look deep within myself and try to f formulate a sound. Because I was angry. Like I was angry like who she to tell me thing I I because initially when I wrote the song and the song for the album, I implemented some some Chinese music, some pan and some things. So the song, but I had to perform for the audition a cappella. So they didn't have all the elements that it had now. And I was so pissed that they all tell me, yo, it's on my channel, I didn't get through. And I was so mad. But in hindsight, it made me develop a song of my own. Um, or, you know, so. I'm really happy to hear that because I thought that's what I observed. But mm -hmm. you and I have busted. actually, you know what? We should we should explain this a little better for people who are listening. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, I want to say this is a good ten years ago now. TNT End had this thing where they had um, local bands, musicians, vocalists coming in to perform for a panel of people that would give feedback and critique, and then I guess whoever was selected was going to be sent forward to some thing, right? Yeah. So it was me, Warren Mann, Glenda Thomas, a couple other people, Michael Salikram, I think, some other people. Um, and when you came up, so this is my memory of it, right? What I remember is, now, of course, we didn't know that you had this track that you then mm. couldn't. So my memory of it is that you came up and you said the, I, I can't remember how you worded it, but it was something along the lines of, Trinidad's answer to John Legend or something like that in the wooding. And and me now, me and Warren Mann have discussed this conceptually prior to this moment with you, right? Mm. We had happened to have had conversations about local artists affecting foreign accents. Not that that's specifically what you were doing, but it ties mm. in, right? We had been talking for years in our conversations with each other about local artists who affect foreign accents when they engage certain types of music. Like there are people who seem to feel like if you're doing dance hall, you need a Jamaican accent. And if you're mm -hmm. singing gospel or R&B, you need an American accent. And I personally hate that shit, right? Because mm -hmm. I feel as though, why would you try to do something that somebody else has naturally better than them? Let Americans sing in American accents and Jamaicans sing in Jamaican accents. Why try to put on a fake accent just because of the genre of music as mm -hmm. opposed to allowing your accent to be the thing that makes you unique and the thing that gives you your cachet. Like to mm -hmm. me, there is no purpose and to use John Legend as the example, even though this is not literally what you were doing, but why try to out John Legend, John Legend? He is mm -hmm. already John Legending. So mm -hmm. find your own, right? So because Warren Man and I had already been having that conversation about people with fake accents and all of this shit, and we know that it's a thing that we are, oh, and the hip hop artists as well would often mm -hmm. affect the fake American accent when rapping, which I also really hate. Our accent is such a fucking delight. Why would you not use that? Mm -hmm. And our language, our expressions, which if you're gonna use the Trini accent, you open the door for all of Trini speak like dread. Mm -hmm. How could you not want to use that? But anyway, so we were coming, our, our general take on it is that the fake accent is a bad scene. So when you came out and said, like I say, something to the effect of Trinidad's answer to John Legend, I was already like, why would you do this to yourself, guy? Why? I think I didn't, say, I didn't say that. 
So who I think said it? Glenn, Glenn, Glenn does said that because I performed this. I performed the song, right? And I, um, because and and what other thing I did too after that 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 time, I kept performing that song, and it's actually one of my favorite songs to perform. I want to play with songs for people to perform. But anyway, she I performed the song, and she said. She was writing in her notes, sound like John Legend. So that is when it came up. Okay. And somebody oh. else agreed with her and was like, you know, thing. And I was like, no, this is not my intention because I specifically had the intention of not or formulating my stuff for this album to not sound like anybody and to write these songs and yeah. use local terms because I have a song called Small Thing where I talk, you know, about, you know, so I try to implement it a lot. Before that, so when it came up, I was like, so pissed. Like, I'm trying my best. So the long but, and short of that was that because because we were getting that that John Legend thing, I know that I, I can't remember exactly what we said, but I know mm -hmm. that I was very adamant that I would like to hear you sing without the John Legend affectation, however mm -hmm. I would have said it. I know that mm -hmm. Warren Mann would have said the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then... Because you and I didn't know each other, know each other at that point when that happened, that was mm -hmm. our only context for each other, really. Mm -hmm. And so we then had years of like being in the same space as each other, but not actually knowing each other or being friends with each other, even though we had all of these friends in common. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a person who loves and lives for growth, especially in artists. Mm -hmm. So... Over the years, when you and I were not friends, I was still paying attention, right? I was like, I wonder if he's going to take on what we said. I wonder if, because you were not the only person who got that critique that day, just so you know. I don't know if mm -hmm. you're aware of that, but several people got that critique that day. Mm -hmm. Because there were other people who were way more than you going hardcore for a foreign accent in their delivery. And he was like, mm -hmm. no. Um, and so there were these years of me being aware of you and just kind of keeping an eye and an air on it and seeing what you were doing. And at some point I was like, I get the feeling like he is actually trying to find his way outside of the John Legend-esque, mm -hmm. you know? I feel as though I was able to see you seeking for that and, and reaching for it. And by the time I then saw you perform with there was a moment when I saw you perform and I was like, all right, I feel like you find it. It might have been a Dio Day performance. Yeah, perhaps. it was that. Yeah, at Black Red Box. I feel so. Before the Carifesta moment, long before yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dio Bejide, and I was And I was in the box and I was like, yeah, okay. So it worked out. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I felt really happy. But I still didn't know you to say it up to you. Like, I, I've mm -hmm. never said this to you before. But from that moment, there was then a, a year or so where I was like, one of these days, I should really just brace John and say this to him. That, you know, I've been paying attention and I'm really pleased to see how he's grown and found his way and developing his own sound and stuff. And I just never did. And then we got thrown together in the Carifesta and ended up liming. And I was like, oh, this is brilliant. <laughs> you know? And then mm -hmm. you must be the grandson thing and I was like well yeah clearly we were supposed to come around to knowing mm -hmm. each other you know mm -hmm. but yeah I've been I've been very pleased to see the growth of what you've been doing from because that really was like 10 years ago eh? yeah that was that was really that was 20, I think it was like 2010 self you know I think it's yeah, almost it was 2010 yeah, and I've and I've been able to watch that and and you know see you finding your space and and then and now we reach where we are now where you're considering even other things you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks. So I was wanted to tell you, you know, thanks for that. Well, thank I, you. I, 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 I'm I, glad I, that you allowed it to be something that propelled you to to better and better, you know. Mm -hmm. Because that um, was my that was part of why I was paying attention too because I didn't know you as a person to mm. know if you would be able to take the critique and run with it in a way that would help you mm. or if it would shut you down. I genuinely didn't know. And so I was kind of like, hmm, I hope this I hope this goes well. I hope this works out. Actually, so that, was a, that was a period of time where I got a lot of critique. Uh -huh. um, that was a period of time between 2010 and probably 2013 or something like that. Uh, got a lot of critique. 
actually seeking critique or was no, it no 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 she was just coming at me because i mean i would i remember it's like i was so people in that space i guess because i remember mm. Kiwan telling me something at one point um and mm. um, bebo so i remember the moments where okay it was you warren man Kiwan, and probably bebo Mm-hmm. had specifically pulled my side and you know told me something and as much as i was upset or didn't take it well i probably took it the right way respectfully I mean, and probably you, went to, hair. you know and in hindsight and you know made me actually ponder and was frustrating and why it is you know um you know why why, why i need to find that connection locally now you know because i would get compliments outside of of here but I didn't want I didn't want I didn't want to be oh he's song foreign. I didn't never like that compliment. I, n- I never understood why people would say that. That as a compliment. Mm-hmm. I hate that people consider that a compliment. Mm-hmm. You, know? you know, so it's so always finding me within the genre that I liked, you know? You know, so yeah. So, yeah. I mean it's been uh, one twenty five. Genre that you like. I have a request. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you interviewed this fella. Um y- Yadav, maybe. Am I yeah. you right? Kata. Yeah. Kata, yeah. And you played this track by Piper's Snipers, Snipers mm-hmm. for Piper. I yeah. would like to hear it again. Could I hear the song? Do you yeah. have it? I'll, I'll, I'll send you to bring back. I'm playing it now. Cause I, I feel as much you might not have it available to pull up right now. Yeah, now the browser I use it now. I can't I can't play audio, but yeah, that was one of them. So let me mind your business. Tell me about this snipers for pipers, whatever, because that lit I didn't know it existed, right? I was tuning into that particular show because mm-hmm. I saw who he was speaking to and I wanted to hear what he had to say. Mm-hmm. So I watched and um and and I didn't even know that that you guys were doing this pipers. What is it? Is it pipers for snipers or snipers for pipers? It's, it's, um, piper like snipers or some something like that. Something piper that. Like snipers. Yeah. So what is it exactly? Is it a thing that exists or was this a one-off thing? And that it, it, it was it was this thing that um G- GSD Productions did, where they had a bunch of artists come together and form different groups now within the rock scene. So they kind of make some mash artists. So I usually have a sense of what GSD is doing, but I don't feel like I knew about this particular Yeah, so they have they, they have a mixtape every year. GSD mixtape. Oh, mixtape. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. So they put together a random amount of artists or bands together and they create a song for a mixtape. So this bunch of us created this group called Pipers Like Snipers. So it featured me, myself, Cutter, um, Blinky, um, Engineer. So it had a rap, the rap so artist. Engineer? Uh, yeah. That's who that was. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because I wasn't looking at the screen. I was walking around doing things and listening. Mm-hmm. But now that you say Engineer, okay, okay. Randall, who who does, who does, um he does rock, but he's one of those screamers now. Uh-huh. He's a screamer vocalist. And I forget the name of the drummer. But anyway, but we, and Marty and and uh, um, I know Aaron there, no, but um, his brethren. But anyway, I forget the name right now. But I hope you can customer. Well, um, she's going to tell us any comments. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the mirror, right? The mirror was the part of the oh, band. The okay, right. Yeah. Right, so right, yeah. so we had this. It was a big band, but anyway, we did this song. And so is that song that you played that day the only song that you guys we did? did, did and we never did any song after that. I and mean, we planning, we've been talking about doing things outside mm-hmm. of it because I like rock music too. You know, I like rock music and the idea of doing a mishmash of rap soul and rock and, I enjoyed and screaming. It. That's, that's why I tell you that's my request. I enjoy yeah. it and I to hear it again. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll post it and I'll I'll tag in it because yeah, that would be great. Post it, let the people I, and them. I think I think it's it's one of those songs that I've created in recent times that I've really really liked the creation of it. One because we was this bunch of artists who were from different <laughs> worlds, and um, I like the, the what we we came out with. You know, we came out with something real, well, us now, 
it was very mm -hmm. unexpected. Like yeah, I, yeah. I just, you know, I was doing whatever I was doing and I was listening and then my ear tuned into it and I was like, oh, but this is, this is serious though. This mm -hmm. is, hmm, hmm. So yeah. Yeah. So I, what's the pipe? I hope the piper's listening because we want to, we have to get back to. Yeah, tell the piper's organized the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, I but I have to go and I have to go and make chow with the, with the young one. So okay. um, I to, I promise that we go and make some um pom city chow. chow. Pom city. You, know, yeah. you know what I mean? So let me wrap up this yeah. and. My Good. neighbor tree have real pomsity on it, mm -hmm. and she don't even eat pomsity, mm -hmm. but she also do share. Mm, one of those. So the birds and the bats living their best life. So you have pomsity on one side and pomerac on one side? The pomerac is in my yard, so I mm. actually have access to the pomerac. I do mm. not have access to the pomsity. The pomsity. She also have, in the same yard with the pomsite, this woman have a sugar apple tree that she so don't touch that sugar apples blackening and rottening on the fucking tree horse. I stand, I stand up in my yard watching this thing and wanting to cry. She have breadfruit just sitting on her tree watching me and she ain't eating nothing. Mm. I, think, I think that she likes having a garden to be in the garden and observe mm garden but she don't seem to pick nothing from her garden and i find food real wasted she have five finger tree too mm. we really live in the bush but she don't like nobody you see she don't like nobody because mm -hmm. i would really like to befriend this lady and and help her dispose of her produce you know mm. what i'm saying i haven't been to sugar in a long time but right? yes and it's yeah. so wonderful and it's so rare these days mm -hmm. you have yard I have yard, I have yard for, for, for things, but I don't have much fruits. Like I have well, fig. I will, I will say this, uh, uh, huh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm going braver than I should, but I will say this out loud right now. I have a bunch of gova seedlings and no room to plant a gova tree. Mm. And gova is getting more scarce as we get older. If anybody what? wants gova seedlings, hail. My, my name is I, I had a, a gova that was... Um, it was too overripe and squishy to eat. Mm -hmm. And I tend to put all my organic matter into my plants so that, you know, return to the earth and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And with this gova, I just chuck the whole gova on, onto the soil next to a pepper plant, intending to go back and mash it up and turn it over into the soil later. And I forgot, and the gova just sat on next to the pepper plant. And now what I have is a little ball with a bajillion little sprouts sticking up out of it. So it looks like a bunch of the seeds have just germinated themselves. So it's really easy to give away if somebody wants it. And I don't have room and there's multiple seedlings. <laughs> so I'm just saying. No, no, no. I go take a gover because my neighbor have a gover tree and um, same, same as you. I think for uh, the roof and chop in and I, I can't enjoy. <laughs> <sighs> So frustrating, Dred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you gonna so, make pumps today, Cho? Mm -hmm. Because so I promised. Where you get your pumps? I bought it in on, on, on Independence Square, which has a whole experience. Oh. People are not following any sort of protocol in Port of Spain, and it's, oh, it's, oh. it's the anxiety. Yeah, Dred. Because <laughs> yeah. when I was buying the, the pumps today, I was going to come to me, and she's like, she was just talking to me. She was talking to the guy now. How much? And she masked down and she chin. I was like, ah, oh, no, no. I feel like I get a whole corona day. Right? You know what I mean? So I feel, I feel so bad the other day. I was I went to the grocery. When I was leaving the grocery, I stopped in this other little store. But because I was walking home from the grocery and I was walking alone, I had pulled down the mask. Mm -hmm. It was just me. And I forgot it was down and I went in this store and I go in the store and I totally talk to the girl, all kind of thing, come back out and suddenly realize the mask was down there and feel so bad. <laughs> so I now pull up my mask and I'm going back in there to say home get because I know her, right? This is a, this is by me. I go in the store all the time. So I went back and I was like, Dred, I'm so sorry. I had the mask down. Why didn't tell me nothing? And she was like, well, I know you safe. And I was like, listen, do not be out here endangering your life. I mean, yes, I am safe, but don't make that assumption. If mm. I come in here with my 
mask, dog, and I start to talk to you, you used to brace me and say, I'm sorry, could you please put on your mask? Mm. And she was so nice about it, but I felt like for people who are working in service and are dealing with people all the time, I feel like they have to take that on themselves to protect themselves, yeah. you know? Because it's people taking it for granted too, you know? Mm -hmm. That, you know, everybody's safe because they're walking and they're talking, but it's a weird time. It's yeah. a weird, weird, weird time. All right, well, cool. This was a nice, nice conversation. It was good to well, talk. Well, to I, knew, I, I knew it would be because you know we have had good conversations before. Yeah, we do good. So, we do good. You know what I mean? I'm, really happy. I'm gonna say it out loud to the world. I am really happy that we got to really know each other during Carifesta at the box. I feel yes. like I feel like we had such a great experience of Carifesta in terms of the shows that we had at the box and the crew we had working together. Working with you was great. Thank I you. loved, loved our little, our little corner of Carifest. Mm. It was so good. And you were a huge part of that for me. And I came away from it feeling like, oh my gosh, this is so lovely. You know? You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, good. It was a good experience. experience. Yeah. It was a and good so experience. This, and so where we are now feels like right where we're supposed to be, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, cool. Thanks, Lisha. Thank you. See, 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 see. I don't think I can post my pipers like snipers, eh? Yeah, yeah. So, so you need to really set you up too much. You was destined to do this. You know what I mean? <laughs> by your friend. When I watched that talk with you and Sonia, I was like, oh my God, now I have to go on there and like, be smart and shit. I feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I <laughs> All right, bless, bless. We can talk, we can talk. All good. Yeah, later. All good. <laughs> Bye. So yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, I just want to remind you all, it's November the twenty eighth, in the living room live here. I want to do. I'm finally doing some some music. Let's talk more music. You know, so um, be performing. It's gonna hundred dollars. Um, right now the the PayPal. I give another issue with the PayPal paywall, but we're doing direct deposit too. You know what I mean? So you can transfer the funds to my account. Um, it's in the event page. I will start, you know, posting more often. But yeah, thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Felicia, for tuning in. And bless, peace, love all you. Yeah. yeah.